Hallelujah. Welcome to Our Power. We were silent as a lamb. Hallelujah. And uh, we're glad you're with us, and thank you for joining us. We are up now, and we got the mic on. Praise the Lord. We're talking about confession. The power of life and death is in the tongue, and uh, they that love us shall eat the fruit there. Hallelujah. Proverbs 18, 21. Last week, we talked about how that the words of our mouth govern our lives, and uh, the was saying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in that sight, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. And we were talking about was, you know, spending time with God and letting God put desires and words in our mouth so that <clears throat> what we say has power and authority in it. Praise God. Let's go tonight. Uh, so um, our first point last week is um, one, our words govern is our our lives. <coughs> so last week we talked about how our words govern our lives, and uh, so let's go kind of fix this here a little bit. So there's more. Our words govern our lives. Okay, that was last week. This week we're going to talk about if, if our words govern our lives, then we better get the words from the right place. We need to get our words what from the right place. This is important. So let's look, if we will, at, at a couple of scriptures. We'll start, first of all, uh, here with Joshua. Uh, chapter 1, verse 8. And uh, let's go there. This is uh, Joshua receiving commandment after Moses, the servant of God, had died. And Joshua taking over uh, as, as the head of everything. So we have uh, Joshua chapter 1. We'll just, we'll read down from, you know, verse 1 on down. Now, at the death of Moses, the servant of God, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the river of this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sea, shall be your coast. There shall not be any man able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance of the land, which I swear unto their fathers, give them. Only be thou strong, and, and uh, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee, be strong of good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whither so ever thou goest. So we have here Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Um, there's a reference here made to the law, this book of the law. Okay. All right. So what was the law at that time? Well, we had Genesis. Okay. Numbers. Leviticus. Deuteronomy. And I just left Exodus. So Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. We have those five books. These five books are referred to as the law. Now, we do know at this time, by the time this is written, Job is being the oldest book of the Bible. 
old chronologically, okay? But what they, they, they refer to the word of God that they had at their hand at their, uh, with them as the, as the law. So this was the word of God. So the law was the word of God, okay? They would be interchangeable terms when, this, when Joshua 1.8 was written, okay? This book of the law. Is, is shall not depart out of thy mouth, thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Okay, so we have here uh, in Joshua 1 8. Joshua 1 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. And so what we're saying is, what, what we have in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy is called and referred to the law. The law of Moses, the law, uh, different things like that. But it is. At that time, what is the Word of God? It is the Word of God. And I'm making this point for a purpose, okay? At the time this was written, the book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. We could quite accurately say the Word of God shall not depart out of your mouth. Why? Because the law was the Word of God, okay? And so to bring it into New Testament terminology, if we're going to apply Joshua 1 8 in the New Testament, then we need to use the terminology of the New Testament. So by saying Joshua 1 8, instead of saying this book of the law, we can say the word of God shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, thou shalt have good success. Or, uh, as the actual Hebrew says, deal wisely in the affairs of life. If, as we said last week, our words govern our lives, and this week, you can break out thing now. If our words govern our lives, if our words govern our lives, then we need to have the right kind of words governing our lives. Did I leave something out? In? No typo catching. Then. Okay, so it, you know, it, it uh, begs the question, if our words govern our lives, then what kind of words do we need to have coming out? Right? Okay, so then we need our words from the right place. Okay? If we're not getting them from the right place and the words are going to govern our lives and we put, we're getting the wrong words out, we're going to get the wrong governing. Okay? We're going to get the wrong things happening. Okay? Uh, it's like buying a pack of seeds and getting the wrong kind of seed. You're not going to get the harvest if you've got the wrong kind of seed. Are you here you're going home? Jesus said, um, he said, he said I, 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 an evil man out of the evil treasure's heart brings forth evil things, and a good man out of the good treasure's heart brings forth good things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if our words are going to govern our mouths and it's within there in abundance, then we better find out where we're going to get the right stuff to put in there so we get the right answers. Now, Joshua tells us where to do it. Let me tell you. Open, Ellen, uh, Williams, whatever the Williams girls is, Marvy, uh, Mari, uh, you know, all the talk, afternoon talk show people, I, and Dr. Phil, I can just tell you ain't none of them, ain't, ain't, I said ain't, ain't none of them. The right place, I know, double negative. Okay, give me a break. Okay. Uh, they are not the place to get. They're, they are, not, they, they, that's all feel good and how they feel about it and what emotion they can stir up and get the audience to clap to and all that kind of stuff when they put the sign up that says applause. Or they got somebody out there going like this so they all cheer, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, and, and, then, and then, you know, brain dead uh, opinions. You can't go there and get your information. You can't take somebody's opinion. All right? Joshua says, God speaking to, remember this now, if you look at this, this is God speaking to Joshua after Moses has died. He says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate. Now, the word meditate, uh, the Hebrew word that's translated meditate means mutter. We all know what muttering is, don't we? Some of y'all do it during church services. All right? Mutter is talking to yourself. 
put under your breath, saying stuff. And somebody said, what would you say? Oh, nothing. I heard, I, I, I was talking to myself. Okay? You, you mutter. We, we mutter. You know, I, you know your, your car, you're muttering. Somebody cuts you off. They think they're doing? You're, you're, you're verbally saying stuff that nobody's listening to except you. And the Bible says, thou shalt meditate. You're not supposed to get in some weird position, oh, burn incense and all this kind of, that's not, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about rehearsing through verbiage. So speaking, what? Joshua wanted the book of the law, or as we've already laid out, that the book of the law was the word of God. So in New Testament terminology, we would say the word of God shall not depart out of your mouth. But you're going to mutter it. You're going to speak it to yourself day and night, okay? Because you need to hear yourself say what the Word of God says. And this is where, uh, through teaching on confession and stuff, uh, that really that, that had gone before. I mean, you know, Kenyon taught it, others have taught it before, but it really got strong in the 70s during the teaching revival, 70s and 80s and so forth, was making a confession, a confession of faith. Many times what people were calling a confession of faith was really the muttering or meditating on the word. They weren't in faith yet. They were muttering it. Okay? And so that, that's where some people got a little confused because they were saying, well, I confessed it, but they really didn't believe it. Because remember, when Jesus said in Mark 11, 23 and 24, that if you'll confess, say with your mouth, okay, whatever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt what's in his heart. But, but, but shall believe in his heart that the things he saith will come to pass. He'll have whatsoever he saith. Okay? And so, but the key way there was with that, he, he, that he shall not doubt, but shall believe that the things he saith shall come to pass. See, a lot of people are, are you know, like I, I said before, they'll get the, the book um, by Jermaine Copeland or by uh, Charles Capps or different ones on confessions, and they'll start making, you know, speaking all those words in there. And because... We've been told that it's faith. They think, well, I've said, I, I spoke my faith, and they really didn't believe it. Why do we meditate or mutter it day and night? So that you observe to do. There is a purpose behind the meditation or the muttering of the word that builds and produces faith in you that the word that comes out of the word. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that you have to mutter it or speak it 50,000 times or 4,000 or 200 or what to receive revelation on it, okay? That's, that's going to be different for different people. And um, when the revelation comes, when they receive it and accept it, that's different for everybody, okay? We, we can't put a number on it. Say it 500 times and you'll get it. Some people might get it the first time. It has to do with where you are in your believing and and. and and relationship with God and that you're open and receiving and you're dealing with unbelief. But the bottom line is, Joshua said, we've got to meditate in it day and night. Okay? This means, a const now listen, we know you can't do this 24-7. Right. Sleep, you got to eat, got to talk to other people. It's, it's the attitude. It's the attitude of meditating consistently, regularly. Okay? Uh, it's impossible for somebody to do it all the time. Okay? Jesus didn't even do it all the time. How do you know? Because he taught the people. And he wasn't speaking the word sometimes when he was talking to people. All right? So, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 6 continues to reiterate this point in uh, Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 13. And again, in um, 11, chapter 11, 18 through 26. Okay? All right, so we've got Deuteronomy and then Deuteronomy, these two different passages. Let's read these. Um, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thy eyes. Now, you've probably seen this before, the little leather pouches that the Hebrews would wear with a leather lap uh, strap, and they would put it on their head and put it around the wrist, 
and in there they would have they would on, on parchment or whatever that type they wrote they would roll that and put it in there okay and um which was symbolic there was no osmosis power in it being there okay they shall um bind them upon the hand and the front between the eyes and thou shalt write them upon the post of the house and on their gates. So they would write scripture on, on, on the house post and on the gates. Okay? And it shall be that the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land which he swore to thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, that, that, uh, and when thou hast eaten and be full, that then beware lest thou forget the Lord which thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and swear by his name. In other words, even the word before them kept them on track with God. Okay? Didn't let them think that they had done, they were some something great. You know? You, uh, without Jesus, you're not better than peanut butter and sliced bread. All right? Okay? And so the, the word of God would keep us in remembrance of what God does. Okay? Joshua says it'll cause us to have good success wise in the affairs of life here Deuteronomy tells us that keeping the word of God before us keeps us humble and keeps us in mind in a mindfulness and a, um, a, a um, not just a mindfulness but also a um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for now um, appreciation and acknowledgement of God's role in our life okay that he's gotten it for us not us we're not gonna get cocky and run and say ah, I did all this by myself it's it's I I, I um I'm amazed at how quickly people forget that God was doing something when they get it. Give him the glory. Give him the glory. Can you say amen? I, I went to the doctor yesterday, the same one that, you know, in the hospital when I cut my toe off. And two weeks later, I had to keep in the back of my mind that I'm probably going to have to have it cut off. You know, and then later said, well, we may just have to cut the tip off. Now he's saying it's progressing nicely, and when it finishes closing up, we'll take you off the antibiotics. So now, you know, he's going, well, it's healed up. It's healing up. You know, it's getting, it's, he's pleased. See, I'm pleased with the progress. I'm like, you know, so you're, you're, he, ain't, he ain't talked about cutting anything in a, in a month. You know, because we're, we keep moving, keep getting better. And keep, he you know, keeps closing in, and keeps getting better and we're healthier and healthier, and healthier every day. Hallelujah. Yeah. No, I'm not playing kickball yet. Hallelujah. Jeff just wants me to go play kickball so bad. All right. Now, Deuteronomy 11, 18 um, through 26, 8. Therefore, thou shalt lay out these words in your heart and in your soul, bind them upon the sign of your hand. They may be frontless between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them without citizen. See, they keep getting told this. See, even in the Bible, it repeats itself and reminds people of stuff. People, oh, you got to have a fresh new sermon everybody's ever heard before. No, you don't. I'll be honest with you. Some folks can't walk what they heard before. They don't need to hear anything else. And you should teach them to your children when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise us up. Thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of the house and upon your gates. Listen to what happens now. When we're keeping the word before us, remember, what do we say? The words, our words govern our lives. He's telling us to keep the word in our mouth, to meditate it, to speak it, to keep it before us. What's he trying to do? get you the words from the right place so that you're speaking the right words that govern your lives. That's, that's just, this is all about. And he says now, now remember uh, Joshua says you'll do wise in the life. Deuteronomy says that when we do this, when we keep it before us like this, that your days will be multiplied. That the days of your children, uh, the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto you, your fathers to give them this word Lord covenant God um, as the day and, and, and which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth God says that when his word governs our lives so um, when God's word Lord, have mercy. The 
governs. What do we get? Days of heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Well, he says here what? When God's word's governing our life, we have days of heaven where? On the earth. When God's word is governing, how does God's word govern our lives? Because our words have been gathered from, have been created by, have been received deposits from meditating in God's word, keeping it before us, feeding on it, muttering it, speaking it, so that now it becomes our words in our mouth, and our words in our mouth, now God's words governing our life, and God says when that happens, we get days of heaven on the earth. Amen? We get days of heaven on the earth. We get it. When? In the now. Not later. Not on the other side. Not when we find out that the circle wasn't broken. Okay? Not when we're standing on Jordan's stormy banks looking over in the Canaan land. You know? Waiting to go in the Canaan land. You know? It's going to be... Uh, Canaan land's not a type of heaven. How do you know? <laughs> there were giants in the land. There were enemies in the land. There's none in heaven. Okay. So God, now, so here we have this, that if our words govern our lives, then it, we, we have to come to the realization that we need to find out where our words need, are coming from or where they need to come from. Joshua tells us. And now that Joshua's told us, now we know where to go get them. And when we keep them before us and we feed on them and mutter them and, and, and meditate on them, now they become our words. And when our words are governing our lives, it's really now, because of this, God's word governing our lives, and it gives us days of heaven on the earth. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. So now we can say that as we meditate, feed on the word. See, we're not just making a confession. And I'm not opposed. I've, I've, uh, it, it's helped so many people. With getting direction on how to make a good confession, how to make a right confession, having the confession books. But it can't just be the rehearsing of what somebody else has said. If you're doing that, then it's meditation. Okay? We said that, you know, meditation is, is you know, muttering or speaking. If you're just rehearsing what something else is, even if you're rehearsing the Word of God, Okay? If you're rehearsing the Word of God, you're meditating. Okay? You are muttering, you're meditating, you're speaking it. When it becomes real to you, when it becomes faith in you, when it becomes what you believe, now it becomes confession. See, meditation leads to confession. Or Well, I'm just, I just mutilated that. Lee. Meditation leads to confession. But what kind of confession? Conf the, really, the confession of faith. There are different types of confession in the Bible. We're not talking about confessing your sins. Okay? We're not confessing our sins one to another. We're not confessing our sins to the Lord. Any man is faith. If any man has sinned, let him... Um, you know, confess the sins, but God is faithful just to forgive us of our sins. That, that's a, this confession that we're referring to right now is uh, the confession of faith or the declaration of faith of your words that you believe because you meditated in the Word of God and kept it before you and you muttered in it and you spoke it and it became real to you. It became what you believe. Okay? Now, we know that by rehearsing before people enough, they'll begin to believe it. For years, no one questioned in, in academia or on the news or anywhere, global, man-made 
global climate change. Okay? Do I believe in global warming? I believe in climate you know, no, Really, they first started that calling it global warming. And then when all the data wouldn't support it, or we started getting cold temperatures instead of hot temperatures, they changed the narrative to climate change. But the key to it was always man-made. They think that we're going to come along and we're going to change this atmosphere. It's so cyclic. Now, back in the 70s, if you were old enough to remember, they ran either on Life or Time magazine on the front cover a, a picture in an editorial or article on the coming ice age. In the 70s, we were going to have an ice age. By the end of the 80s and 90s, we were coming into a global warming catastrophe. And back then, they would say, you know, that it's, you know, they started on the global warming things, that the man-made fluorocarbons were uh, creating a greenhouse effect in the atmosphere, and that was causing the earth to heat up because it was trapping excess heat in and not letting it out. The problem was that when the temperatures didn't rise the way they said, they came back and said that that same atmospheric pollution was blocking the sun from coming in, which kept it from heating up and causing global cooling. You can't make this stuff up. They do, but you can't make up how they did it. Okay? It, it would make a good Hollywood movie. Oh, it did, The Day After Tomorrow. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good movie to watch as far as special effects. and you know, fun. You know, Now they refer to these super high, low pressure systems as, as those uh, super vortexes, just like they did in that movie. And, you know, it's pulling, it, it's pulling cold air out of space and all this kind of stuff. Really? So that means that uh, our atmosphere is completely open and we're just sucking air out of space. That means all of our atmosphere oxygen should be floating out into space. You know, they just come up with all kinds of stuff. But they said that long, and they said it for so many years. You have got people right now who bow at the altar of the, of the global warming religion, man-made climate change religion, okay? That if we don't stop, man, we're, you know, so what happens? You plant trees in Africa, and you can drive whatever car you want to in America. Al Gore lives in a house bigger than probably 15 or 20 families would live in. And his carbon footprint's bigger than people, probably a hundred people's footprint. But he's planted trees in Africa, therefore he's offset his carbon footprint. He can continue to do it. And wants you to buy stuff so that you can buy fruit trees in Africa or wherever and offset your carbon footprint, all the while they're getting richer. The global warming people are getting richer. And they want to tax America and give it to other countries. Communists. These are all socialist, communist little tactics. The thing I'm after here, though, is that through the continual weather channel weatherchannel.com the weather channel itself always running specials on global climate change there was a big article on the other day yes it's cold but climate change is still real yeah so they're always you know, so, but they, they preach people just believe it no matter what because the scientists said it the scientists said it it has to be true. That's just like if it's on the Internet, it has to be true. They don't understand. The scientists get, um, get grants to do studies. And the only way you get regranted is to give the people who gave you the grant the information they want so they fund you again. Their livelihood is tied to it. So they have to create data that continues keeping the money coming in. But the point is, they've said it long enough, 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 long enough that people believe it. How many of you have ever heard the word democracy? We are not a democracy. The United States of America is not a democracy. You know, that's why people are upset with the last election. You know, Hillary won two or three more million votes than Trump. Therefore, she should be president. We're not a democracy. We're a federalized constitutional democratic republic. And the reason that we are all that federalized Demo uh, constitutional democratic republic is to prevent the mass rule, the mob rule of, you know, mob rule. Jefferson stated that uh, why would he trade 3,000, because they wanted a pure democracy. When they went to meet and create the Constitution, the first thing on the table was a pure, pure democracy. And Jefferson stood up and said, why would I trade one tyrant, the king, 3,000 miles away for 3,000 tyrants 
one mile away, mob rule. And that is when they, be, they began to work together and came up with a, uh, a part of the, the, uh, the Roman Empire's idea of a republic. So we became a representative or democratic republic. Simply, for, absolutely, you think brilliant to protect the interests of smaller states from California. Okay? Because the big cities in America would tell everybody else in the country what to do in a pure democracy. Okay? But we're representative, so we had this broken down differently. But people here were democracy. We're, yeah, I hear people say it, and I'm like, you know, you, you get politicians up there. This is not this is not how democracy works. We're not a democracy. But because it's been said, been said, been said, been said, you go out on the street court and talk to the average person. Yeah, we're we're a democracy. We know people who vote Democratic who come from Mexico, and they say I'm a Democrat. Why? Because of the democracy in America. We're not a democracy. You know. And I'm just saying, you know, they, that's the reason they do it, because they've been told these things. They now believe it. Now, here's my point. If we will tell ourselves what the Word of God says enough, we'll believe it. And we will live our lives in accordance with it. You've got college kids running around, and then they can be like lunatic crazy over something. Some professor told them enough. You know, that the, the capitalism is evil, that America is evil. We shouldn't have anything. We should give it all away. And they're all running out there, and they're burning people's cars up, beating them up, you know, um, blowing them up, and all this kind of stuff, because it's not right. It's wrong, because they, they, they bought into it. They believed it. They heard it so much, they believed it. And it's governing how they act. So, it, and let me say this. It's not wrong to receive information to the point it governs you, it's how God created us. It's that Satan has manipulated it and used it against people so that they're not putting God's word in there and getting the information from God's word to the point it now governs them. Because if we would do the exact same thing, if we would, if we, listen, right now, because of all the years, you can't talk about God in the classroom, you can't, uh, you can't share about Jesus. You can't do anything. But they can. How many know that secular humanism is a religion? The IRS recognizes the Humanist Manifesto, the the the, rec, the religion of secular humanism, as a five hundred one c three nonprofit religious organization. What is the belief of secular humanism? Atheism. There is no God. Our school systems, our colleges, are ruled. And live and bow at the altar of atheism. No God. And it's preached all the time. They preach evolution as fact. And it is still a theory. They're just theories. It is the theory of evolution. The Big Bang theory. All the things they have about the, the beginning of the universe and all this stuff. And it's all theory, but it's taught as fact because it's anti-God. It's atheism. Man is the, the greatest of all things. It's all evolution. But it's been taught, it's been taught, it's been taught, it's been taught. Now, Jesus, as the Bible is referred to in, you know, uh, religious terms of, of religious zealots and uninformed and that kind of thing. Kids are believing it. They're getting where they don't believe in God. Myth, the myth of God, the myth of creation. Um, back in the 70s, I remember reading an article from a guy at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and said, our next main focus in education is to remove the myth of God from the classroom. To remove the myth of God from the classroom, and they have succeeded. God's been removed from the classroom under the guise of separation of church and state. which there is no such term in the Constitution. And the Supreme Court justice that did it was inspired of the devil. He used a personal letter of Jefferson to a friend who used that, the fact there was an impenetrable wall between the church and the state, meaning you could, that, that, that they would never have a state-organized or a state-enforced religion. 
like the Church of England. That's what they, that's what they were afraid of, was that the state demanded everybody be Church of England or they died. It was never to keep God out of the classroom, okay? It was to keep God, it was not to keep God out of the government, but the government out of God. They couldn't enforce God on people. But we've, we believed it. We've heard it so long. Now the kids are beginning to believe that. They don't believe, you know, the kids don't believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus. The parents don't take him to church. You can't talk about the Ten Commandments in school. And we wonder why we have people running around in, in absolute anarchy. All over the place. Because there is no moral compass. There's no moral guide. But that's because people have been using meditation or feeding information in people's lives so that the wrong things govern in their life. Now, we're working in opposition to that. We're working opposite of that. We're working as believers that we're going against the course of this world. Okay? We're working opposite of that. So we've got to go to the place whose words are higher. Okay? God's word is higher. God's word's above it all. Can you say glory? Hallelujah. Um, oh, come on. I know it's in here. Isaiah 55. Okay? So if we're going to combat this, Isaiah 55, um, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord may, um, while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Okay? Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down from heaven, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So here we have let the wicked forsake their thoughts. Forsake their thoughts. Why? Because when their thoughts and their words are wrong, they govern their life and they govern it in the wrong way. But God says my word and my thoughts are higher than yours. Back when all the science said the earth was flat, the Bible said God uh, wrote on the circumference of the earth. Anybody know how, with the shape of a circumference? Does anybody know? It's round. The Bible contradicted science, but the intellectuals believed that the earth was flat. So much so that they all believed that they went too far out, they'd fall off the edge. They even had pictures and drawings of maps where the earth just went out and dropped off. It was flat. Ships would just fall off. They would never, if they got lost at sea, they went out and fell off. They believed it. They just absolutely believed it because science told them so. Columbus was sitting on the dock of the bay <laughs> watching the ships roll away, but he noticed something. He noticed as they went out, they, got, they, they shortened on the horizon and they disappeared from bottom to top. Instead of being flat, they started going down until the top ma of the mass disappeared. They weren't dropping off. He, he then began to th uh, theorize, because it was a theory at that point, the earth was round instead of flat. Okay? Which caused him to want to go sell around the world. And we call our, our native 
people here, Indians, because he thought he'd gotten in India. Thought he had sailed to India. Okay? All right. So, we, we, we have here God saying, my words are higher than your words, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, that when they come down to the earth, they water it and make it to bring forth in bud, and they accomplish the thing he sent it to do. So then we begin to analyze the word. Well, if God sent his word to do something, how do we know what it's sent to do? It tells us what it was sent to do. Whatever the scripture says is what it was sent to do. If you feed on this word, you'll prosper. If you feed on this word, you'll deal wise in the affairs of life. He sent his word and healed them. There's healing scriptures. There's prosperity scriptures. There's deliverance scriptures. There's victory. And they will accomplish what they were sent to do. God says they won't return to him void. How does his word return to him? If he, if his words come down from heaven, how do they return? He said they, he didn't say they wouldn't return to him. He said they wouldn't return void. They won't return fruitless. They won't return without accomplishing. How do they return? They return through our words. Our words return his word. Our words of faith are spoken to the atmosphere. And they accomplish what they were sent to do. They prosper in the thing they were sent. They do not return void. They, uh, they return in producing or producing what God sent them to produce. Can you say Shanda? Amen. Amen? So, getting our words from the right place, is imperative. Okay? Okay? The 119th Psalm is a psalm that every verse makes a reference to the Word of God. Now, it uses different terms. Precepts, statutes, law, commandments, these different things. But it's all a reference to the Word of God. Every single stanza of that psalm makes a reference to the Word of God. The interest of that word giveth light. It giveth, it giveth uh, understanding to the simple. Okay? Um, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh, how I love thy law. It's the meditation of my heart all day. These, all these different scriptures from the, from the 119th Psalm, it's a psalm of the word, of what the word will do, how important the word is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All 100 plus verses. Okay? It's called the longest book in the Bible. It's the longest, you know, whatever. So, here we have it. We have power in our words. Our words govern our life. We need to get them from the right place. That right place is God's word. That meditating on it leads to the confession of faith. And when we let it govern and control and, 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 and uh, uh, govern our life, then we have days of heaven on the earth. Amen? And somebody say glory. All right. Well, we're so glad you all joined us tonight. We believe that you, you received some uh, wonderful revelation and teaching that will help change your life, and you can walk in days of heaven on the earth. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you, and remember that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Bless you. Love you, and see you next time.